Hello everybody and welcome to the episode on my channel. Hope you've all had a great long weekend. I know I have. I spent some much needed time unwinding and relaxing with my family and I hope you're able to do the same. Now today I have a very exciting video. I love looking at companies in my portfolio and doing a broad overview of their business. A lot of my viewers have found value in that learning about different companies and why my uh, investing thesis for them is so strong or basically why I invest in those companies. Now, if that's something that you've enjoyed or you haven't even seen it on my channel, I encourage you to go and look back at my previous videos. I've made business overviews on Brookfield Corp, uh, Brookfield Asset Management, American Express, Texas Instruments, Visa. I just did one last week on Costco. I also did one on Lowe's uh, and I, on, on a bunch of other companies. So I plan to do a business overview on each of the companies in my portfolio that way you can go and see why i'm actually investing into these companies so without further ado let's go and dive right into this video and we'll be looking at t row price so t row price's business overview then we will look at their financial statements we will do a trend analysis on t row price and then we will also conclude by uh, talking about my investment thesis on why i hold t row price in my YouTube dividend growth stock portfolio. So without further ado, let's go and look at T-Row Price. So T-Row Price here trades under the ticker T-R-O-W, makes up about 3% of my dividend growth portfolio here, and that they are operating in the wealth management sector. Now, when we look at my annual dividend income per stock, on a percentage basis, T row price makes up about 5.8% of my annual dividend income. So it's a pretty significant portion of my annual dividend income. Now, what we're gonna do is go and look at T row price. All right, so I've just gone to the T row price corporate website here, and I want to learn about T row price. All right, so. They are an independent global asset management firm focused on helping people meet their long-term financial needs. So basically what an asset management firm is, is you give them your capital or your funds. So by capital or funds, I mean your money to invest. So they invest in uh, securities, so that's stocks, or they invest in bonds and other assets for you. And then they charge you fees for providing that service. So while you give them their money to invest, they are investing that and hopefully growing your capital over time. And then they charge you a fee on that based on your arrangement with them. So who they are at a glance. So they have, they manage about 1.40 trillion. So that's trillion, not billion, trillion in assets under management. So when you hear the term assets under management or AUM, or also known as Assets Under Administration, or AUA, that means that that is the money or the assets that the company, T. Rowe Price, is managing for their clients. And again, how T. Rowe Price earns money is they charge fees for managing those assets or managing your stocks or bonds. They have about 7,000 associates globally, and they are in 52 countries in which they serve clients and shareholders. Now, what's really cool about T-Row Price is they have been around for more than 85 years. So what they state here is that they're united around a single goal, helping people close the gap between what they have and what they'll need so they can live confidently. So basically, growing your assets over time to help you retire. Now, they earn their clients' trust by pursuing excellence and investing year after year despite changing markets. And they've been doing it since 1937. So this is a very old company, uh, respectively. So they've been around for a long time. So let's go and click at what else they do. All right, so we saw that they, where they bridge the gap and they'll need to so they can live confidently, in my words, uh, basically help people grow the capital over time in order to allow you to retire or meet your financial goals. Now, they're guiding principles. So what they do is they connect us by driving how they work together every day to help their clients meet long-term financial goals. So they do rigorous research to have great ideas. They want to deliver strong long-term returns for their clients. And they uh, uh, have a culture of integrity in which they put their clients first. So that's just broad 
speaking terms in terms of TRO price. Now, what I would really like to do is they actually have some videos here. And yeah, like looking at the history of the company, in my opinion, is great because that allows you to see where they came from and possibly where they will grow. So let's scroll down and let's, yeah, this, they have this cool video. So uh, who better to tell us what T. Rowe Price is or their history than T. Rowe Price? So let's go and check this video out. the U.S. economy, already reeling from an unprecedented stock market crash, entered a sharp recession. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which celebrated a record high of 381 in 1929, plunged from a high of 200 to 100 in 1937, a stunning 50% loss. In 1937, a 39-year-old investment analyst and former chemist hoping to build a brighter future, opened his own investment company. Thomas Rowe Price Jr. applied the same scientific method he used in the lab to financial research, binding and investing in stocks poised for long-term growth. Mr. Price loved investing, but he didn't love the way firms treated their clients. This inspired him to start a different kind of company, one dedicated to putting the client's interests first. I believe our client's interests should come first. We should do well when they do well. As the post-war economy rebounded, the firm launched its first fund in 1950. Mr. Price believed in finding companies with strong long-term earning potential for clients and holding on to them through the ups and downs. That philosophy captured the energy and confidence in the future that helped define the 1950s. And Mr. Price became known as the father of growth stock investing. In 1969, he launched the first dedicated natural resources mutual fund in the U.S. He believed inflation would pose a danger to investors during the 1970s and felt resource stocks could prosper in this environment. He was right. During the early 1970s, people began to take a more active role in their retirement planning. Many didn't want to depend solely on a pension if they had one. Seeing an opportunity to help our clients build a more optimistic financial outlook we established our first U.S. retirement account in 1974, giving clients more control over their retirement savings. In the late 1970s, the firm saw attractive prospects in an expanding global economy. And in 1979, after years of careful planning, we expanded our operations to include Europe and Asia, giving our clients access to some of the world's fastest growing companies. In 1999 and 2000, technology stocks soared. Zero Price was widely criticized for avoiding many of these high-priced companies from publications such as the Wall Street Journal. In response to these critics, Vice Chairman James Reapy responded. We've got to stick to our principles. Even though these principles might hurt us in the short term, we have discipline and we'll keep on doing this for a long time. Several weeks later, the industry collapsed T. Rowe Price remained largely unscathed. By standing by our strategic investing approach at a time when it would have been easy to give in to the fad, we were able to carefully steward our clients' investments once more. In 2006, a T. Rowe Price analyst expressed deep concern about the lax standards for mortgage underwriting. The analyst listened to calls and heard the concern when adjustable mortgage holders said they didn't know how they'd make their payments. In the morning, the firm largely abandoned the subprime debt market well before the crash, sheltering both our clients and their investments. After more than 80 years, putting clients first is still at the heart of T. Rowe Price's business. Our strategic investing approach takes us around the world to research promising companies, uncovering long-term opportunities for our clients. We're proud of our history and how we've built on Mr. Price's vision to create a strong global company. We know there will always be market uncertainty, but whatever the future brings, we'll be by our clients' sides, helping them pursue their goals and to feel more confident about tomorrow. All right, what a great video. So to summarize, uh, I know that was a lot, but basically T. Rowe Price, they are an asset manager so they manage your money, like I said before, 
for you and then they charge fees on that. Now what they do is it's called strategic investing or active investing. So they pick the stocks that go into a fund and they have many funds and then they invest your money into that fund. Now that as opposed to passive investing such as ETFs or index funds where they where those funds are not uh, containing any specific specifically picked companies by people but rather based on criteria set by that fund so for instance you have the S&P 500 which has the fi uh, largest 500 US companies that is based on market cap or market capitalization and that is when a company is chosen on specific factors including its market capitalization or how much money is invested into that company now T. Rowe Price again like I said they do the opposite they research companies and then they decide on their own factors which companies to include in their funds and thereby invest your money into those funds. Now, if we look at a summary of this video, we can then see right here 1937, uh, uh, Thomas Rowe Price set out to create this organization. They launched their first mutual fund in 1950. This is their flagship fund or their most famous fund, the growth stock fund. In 1960, they launched, launched a second mutual fund and they grew to about 100 associates. 1970, they had started a bond or a fixed income division. So that could be bonds or preferred shares or, or whatever, any fixed in income instrument. They had in 1974, uh, some sponsorships leading to defined contribution plans. So we'll look at that when we look at their breakdown of their assets under management. But basically, uh, if you're familiar with this, or even if you're not, uh, investors can either be retail. So that's probably people like you and myself, which are private investors and we just invest our own money. Then there's institutional money. That is things such as pension plans uh, or other large sums of money, which are invested on behalf of other people. And those are huge sums of money invested. So T. Rowe Price also manages a lot of uh, institutional funds as well. 1979, they began a joint venture with the UK partner Fleming, and then they had many inter new international strategies. And then here we can see in 1986, they grew to 17 funds, and then they actually started, they took their company public and became uh, trading on the NASDAQ as T. Rowe. So before 1986, it was a private firm, and then in 1986, T. Rowe Price actually became a public firm, so you could buy stock in the ticker or company T. Rowe. 1990, they launched their retirement plan services in 1990 to 1999, 2000. They joined the S&P uh, stock index and they acquired the full ownership of the Roll Price Fleming International. Now here we can see what I would say is in 2019, they actually introduced ETFs that employed the firm's successful, successful actively managed investment approach. So here, these ETFs are not passively managed they are actively managed using T. Rowe Price's investing principles. In 2020, they got total assets of $1 trillion. So that is a huge, huge accomplishment for T. Rowe Price. They got $1 trillion in assets under management, or AUM. In 2022 to 2023, they got a new global head headquarters at Harbor Point, and they acquired Oak Hill Advisors. So that is a very cool history about T. Rowe Price. So if, if you enjoyed that uh, I would, and you had any questions on their history, I encourage you to leave any comments below and I can try to do my best to answer those. Now let's go and look at the financial statements of Tiro Price. So what I've done is I've opened their Form 10-Q. So these, this is the most recent quarter's financial statements or financial results. Let's go and scroll down. So we're going to be looking at their balance sheet, income statement, and cash flows. So let's go and look at their balance sheet. So the balance sheet, if you're unfamiliar, has the assets, that's the assets of the company, the liabilities or the things that they need to pay for, and then the equity in the company. So let's go and look at the balance sheet. There we go. So the assets. So again, this is comparing June 30th, 2023 results to the uh, previous uh, December 31st, 2022 uh, quarter. And remember, a balance sheet is just a point in time. It is not for a trailing three months like quarterly results of an income statement but it is just that specific point in time so specifically here on june 30th 2023 compared to specifically here on december 31st 2022 so as we can see here the cash and cash equivalents and i believe this is in millions yep so they have about 2.2 billion here in cash and cash equivalents 
761 million in accounts receivable investments here another 2.7 billion so that's awesome uh they had uh consolidated sponsored investment products here of 1.9 million operating lease assets of 261 million and i'll break break these down but basically the operating lease assets and, and opposed to the operating lease liabilities this is just an ifrs 16 standard uh again i won't get too technical but basically whenever you have uh uh, lease you need to now record it as an asset and a liability as opposed to just recording the lease expense so in my opinion i wouldn't even look at this lease asset or this lease liability as an asset or a liability i would just kind of you can look at them and see the numbers but basically they're they're usually pretty close and it's, it's just for the lease payments uh, so property plant and equipment so their capital assets here 771 million intangible assets and goodwill uh, <laughs> at 2.6 billion uh, other assets at 692 million and total assets of 12 billion so that seems like they have a lot of cash here on hand and investments so that's good to see now let's go and look at the liabilities because you can always have a lot of cash but you might have a lot of debt or liabilities that you need to pay for and when i look at euro price that is actually not the case so they have uh ap or accounts payable of 381 million they have those consolidated uh, invest investment products here at 71 million we have lease liabilities which again correspond to the lease assets so it's not really a lease liability or an asset they have accrued compensation okay so they need to pay out this compensation uh supplemental savings plan a liability of 817 million uh income taxes payable now what's really great is if you haven't noticed is the total liability balance here is 2.17 billion and they have more cash than that at 2.2 billion so they could pay off all of these liabilities with this cash and they'd still have some cash left over. And that again is not even cashing in these short-term investments that they have here of another 2.7 billion. So this is a very cash rich company, a very strong balance sheet in my opinion. It's it's amazing. They, they don't have, and another thing is they also don't have any debt. So this company does not have any debt. They just have their accounts payable and then some other very small liabilities in comparison to their cash and other assets balance. So a very, very strong balance sheet in my opinion. Okay, now let's go scroll down and let's look at their income statement. All right. So what they're doing here is comparing the three months. So June 30th, 2023 to June 30th, 2022. And then the six month period or the half year uh for the six months of june 30th 2023 to june 30th 2022 so i encourage you to look at the comparables here in the total column and i'm going to be going through the uh, june 30th 2023 results so the revenues here so this is what i want to talk about in detail so like i said they have those uh you know 1.4 trillion dollars of assets so what they do is they charge investment advisory fees on those assets so when you're investing money with t row price it's pretty cool in terms of the the way that they do this. You basically invest your money and then they'll charge you a fixed percentage based on the amount of money you have or the agreement with them every year. So what what the industry actually used to be like a, a long time ago was they used to just stockbrokers and, and other asset management firms would just charge you commissions on trades and they would get a commission based on putting you into a specific security or stock and that would be how they make money now what has happened is the the way that the industry has shifted is they charge you what they call a management fee so this can be let's just say for all intents and purposes one percent per year so t Rowe price would take your money and they would say you know what we're not going to get a commission on this or whatever we're going to charge you one percent of the total funds that you have in your account per year and that is going to be our revenue. Now, what this does is it aligns their interests with yours. They want your account to grow very or grow at a high rate and get to a higher dollar value because then they will get more revenue. If you think about it, if I have a a $1000, uh, I'm going to get what whatever 1% of $1000 is and then I will then use that as my revenue for T roll price. So I am more incentivized to make that thousand dollars grow over time, so I get a a higher revenue fee. So in that example, if I had a thousand bucks and I was invested with Euro Price, they would get ten bucks. They would get ten dollars a year. Now that's not a lot of revenue, 
as opposed to if they have a million dollar account or a you know a 10 million dollar account and they're getting that one percent on a 10 million that would be closer to one hundred thousand dollars of revenue so that is how they charge fees it's based on the total dollar value of your uh, account and this is great too because as a client you you know that they're incentivized to make your money grow over time because they will end up wanting to get a higher dollar value now the percentage stays the same but the dollar value as your dollar value increases their fee increases as well it's it's great on both sides because it allows the client to know that they're not putting them into products that will will hopefully detriment or perform poorly on their account thereby decreasing their dollar value over time they know that the fund manager or t row price in this case wants to grow their money over time because they are incentivized as they will keep getting a larger dollar value now this also makes this business very great because the revenue can be forecasted uh not counting the market conditions of course which is actually a big factor but the revenue the percentage is known and that money just keeps coming in as revenues for t row price as opposed to one-time commissions so the revenue revenue stream there is very very fixed in terms of the source but not the dollar value all right so that was a little bit of a rant but investment advisory fee revenue so that is that percentage that they charge uh every year for managing your money so about 1.4 billion then we have capital allocation based income very small 38 million administrative distribution and servicing fees so we have a total net revenue of 1.6 billion and when we look at it in the prior quarter uh, in the prior year for the same quarter was about 1.5 billion so it's up slightly there let's look at the operating expenses so the biggest expenses with these type of companies is the people the rent and the it so what you're going to see here is the largest expense right now is paying people or their staff because again, remember, this is not a physical product. This isn't a manufacturing company. It's not a semiconductor company. There's no real end product other than the people's ideas and using those ideas to create funds, which are their clients' money is then invested into. So it's a little hard for people to grasp that. It's almost like looking, just think about it as an intangible product. A tangible product is something you can touch, but an in intangible product or something like that is something you cannot really touch. So that's how I think about it. Now, compensation and related costs. So 650 billion. So that right there is a huge cost. And as you can see from the prior year in that same quarter, it's gone up a lot. So they had a lot of salary increases here and they had to pay a lot of related costs as was the case for many, many other companies. So that was a huge increase in costs. The distribution and services, a very small advertising and promotion. It stayed pretty consistent with the prior year. Uh, product and record keeping related costs, again, consistent. Technology occupancy and facility costs. So the second largest, like I said, technology, uh, rent and facility costs. Uh, it's It's gone up as well, uh, about 20 million from there. And then if you look at the total operating expenses, they have increased. And again, the majority of that increase is coming from this compensation and related costs that we had from this high inflationary environment and this tight jobs market where people were people's salaries also increased a great deal. So when you look at the net operating income, so this for this quarter it actually was down a lot. Uh, it was came down from 667 million down to 533 million uh, for this same quarter in the prior year. And when you look at it for the six months or the year to date, it is down quite a bit. So that is huge, huge reduction in net operating income. But the beauty of this business is that they are still generating positive income and it is very, very scalable. Like we saw, the compensation is the highest cost. All of the other costs, barring the technology and occupancy, were pretty relative. So any large increases in revenue or when the market does well, it it has a very, very positive impact on the bottom line. All right, so that was the income statement. Now let's go and scroll down uh, to the earnings per share. So again, if you follow this through, again, I don't like to look at this, uh, the income taxes really, but you, you can. Uh, so you can look at the net income. And again, it, it kind of tells the same story. It's a little bit closer, but that's because of these, you know, provision for income taxes and then these non-operating adjustments. So when I'm looking at it on terms of an investment basis, I don't like to look at a lot of these adjustments that are made here. I know that they actually do flow down to the bottom line and the earnings per share, 
but I like to look at the net operating income. But if you're interested, the net income here was actually higher for T Row price than the prior year. And when you look at six months year to date, it's basically the same. And you can see that again in the earnings per share. So that is the uh, earnings of the company divided by the share count. And then you can see that's 2.07 compared to 1.47 in the prior year for the same quarter. And then on the six months year to date, it's relatively the same. All right, so we're going to scroll down to the statement of cash flows. All right, so the statement of cash flows, and they're comparing the six months ended uh, for 2023, June 30th, and then June 30th, 2022. So what happens here is you take your net income, and then you adjust for any uh, non-cash items. So you get to add back depreciation, amortization, uh, stock-based comp here, and then you can flow down and get the net cash provided by the operating activities. So $906 million compared to $1.7 billion from the previous uh year for the same quarter or the six months sorry so the operating expenses i like to think about it this way the operating expenses are the cash flows from the operations of the company as opposed to the other sectors so when you look at the investing uh, activity so that is when t row price or the company makes investments so here you can see they made purchases of 27 million uh dispositions of sponsored investment products of 73 million uh, they got cash for that uh, decon consolidation additions to property equipment and hardware and now this is a big ticket item so this is where they're spending money or reinvesting this money into their organization and they spend about 132 million on additions to property plant and equipment and software so that's a pretty significant investment and that's something to look out for in future quarters as well and you can see that the net cash using investing activities is about 136 million so they spent a lot more this year in investing in terms of investing their cash flows back into the company now another uh, item here to look out for is this dispositions of sponsored investment products they had a large uh, cash flow come in from this in the previous year so again if you take that out or adjust for that they're actually relatively uh, the same in terms of investing from this from the previous year all right so financing activities i like to look at that this is and you know things in terms of paying down debt or uh, purchasing common stock or issuing common stock so as we can see repurchase of common stock last year they had a huge amount that they that they bought back 510 million for this six months they only bought, bought back about 50 million so you'll see even when we look at their dividend which we can actually look at right now so the dividends paid to common stock uh common stockholders of t row price 12.1 million as opposed to 7.8 million in the previous year and that's all oh, that's common sorry that's common share issuances so common share issuances so that's the uh share issuances that they pay, paid out for the stock based compensation to their employees it's about 12 million compared to 7.8 so they actually issued a decent amount of common stock now sorry these are the dividends here paid to those common uh shareholders so 562 million so that's a great amount of dividends and compared to the same uh, six month period in the prior year it's about 556 million so they increased it slightly so what's happening is they bought back a lot of stock in 2022 they issued a lot of dividends but here they were a little more disciplined in terms of buying back stock so they they did not buy back that much at all really uh, but they did buy some so that's still great and they slightly raised the dividend i think when i looked at the news release it was about one or two percent so what happened was in 2022 as you're all probably familiar and even happening now is the market has been pretty volatile uh and then in terms of earnings with t row price their earnings they sure they get additions from clients which they then invest their money but a lot of their performance is going to come from how the market performs so when the market is volatile their revenue and their earnings are also volatile because the fees or the revenue that they get all depends on that percentage that they get to charge on their client accounts, which is dependent on the market. So if their client accounts performance is down, then the, their revenue uh, conversely will also come down as well. So it's very proportionate and very related in that sense. So what they're doing here is being very wise with their capital allocation strategy, and they are not divvying out all those funds or purchasing a lot of common stock when they know they actually need to keep that cash on hand just in case the market stays down for a while but the great thing about this company too is that when the market does very well they also do very well and they get higher revenues so that's something to keep in mind there when thinking about their uh, purchases of common stock 
and then also the dividends that they pay out. So their net cash use and financing activity is 320 million. And then when you look at that ending cash, it's relatively the same as the prior year for the same quarter. So again, very disciplined capital allocation strategy, and I love to see it. Again, this, this cash balance is super, super strong when you're comparing the cash balance compared to the liabilities. All right, so that was the financial statements of T. Rowe Price. Now let's go and do a trend analysis. So we're going to be looking at my portfolio here on Qualtrum. This is the one that I share on YouTube. This is my work portfolio. Let's go and dive in the one that I share on YouTube. All right, and as you can go, to, as you can see, we'll go to my holdings. Scroll down and let's find T. Rowe Price. All right, T. Rowe Price Group. It trades on the NASDAQ exchange under the sim, uh, ticker symbol TROW. Trades for about $112.90 per share. Now the next earnings of it is October 26th. So I'll be looking at those. I'll probably break those down on my channel as well. Let's go and scroll down and let's look at some metrics. So here, valuation. So we have the market capitalization or the market cap. So it's about $25.32 billion. The price to earnings, this is a valuation metric. So again, that is the price of the stock. So the 112.90 divided by the earnings per share of the company. And as you can see here, it's around 16 to 17 on a present or forward basis. So a pretty much in line or a little bit under actually, I believe the S&P 500's price to earnings. So it's, pre it's pretty close, 16 to 17. Now you have some other valuation metrics here, price to sales, uh enterprise value to ebitda price to book but again i'm not going to get too much into the details this is the business overview now look at the dividend so the dividend yield here is pretty high it's a nice 4.32 percent so you're getting rewarded uh very very well on your dividend here for inv your investment into the company at 4.32 percent now when you look at the payout ratio it is pretty high so it's 72.13 percent so the payout ratio again that is based on net income so usually the companies that I invest to, I like to have their dividend payout ratio a little bit lower at around 60%, but I'm okay with it in terms of T. Rowe price because well, as we saw with their balance sheet, it's very, very strong. And their net income, they're able to cover all of their expenses and still pay out that, hef that hefty dividend at, like I said, a 4.32% of, of the dividend. And they still have a decent cash balance on hand. Now, granted, they didn't buy back a lot of stock like we saw for the past six months, but they were still able to pay out that dividend. So this payout ratio, even though it's 72%, it's still fairly safe in my opinion. And we'll look at why in a second. So when we look at the cash flow, we can see that the free cash flow yield is 5.10%. So a lot of free cash flow and then adjusted for stock-based compensation is a nice strong 4%. Now, we'll look at the margin. So this is what I mean when I say that this is a very scalable business and that and that they have a very, very high operating margin. So when you look at the operating margin, it's at 32%. When you take all their expenses and other items into consideration, the actual profit margin is a nice strong 24.70%. So almost a quarter of their revenue is flowing down to the profit margin line. So that is a very, very healthy profit margin. When you look at terms of other companies, I'm going to go on the very low end and look at Costco at like 2%, some other retails at like 8 or 10%. T. Rowe Price has a very strong profit margin at 25%. So that is great to see in a company. A lot of that cash flow is flowing down to the, to the uh, company as a profit, or sorry, that revenue is flowing down as a, as a profit in terms of net income. And then they're generating a lot of free cash flow as we saw over here. Like we said here, looking at the balance sheet, they had no debt, so zero debt, and $2.25 billion in cash, and that's not counting their short-term investments, which was also around $2 billion. So a very, very strong balance sheet and a very strong snippet here in terms of the uh, uh, financial strength of T. Rowe Price. I'm going to look at there is these results annually. All right, so let's look at the revenue. All right, so the revenue has grown at a nice 7.94, almost 8% per year uh, since about 1985. You can see the revenue is ebbs and flows with the market, but in terms of the overall direction, it is trending up. So that is great to see. 
Now, when we go and look at their EBITDA or their earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation, we can see that it is growing at an even higher rate at 8.21% per year over the past uh, 30 or 4 years. So when we look at, we can even look at it on a 10-year basis. And at, at a 5 or 10-year basis, you can see it's growing at 11.45%. Now, as you can see, this is dependent on how the market moves. So again, like I said before, T roll price is very volatile in that sense. So as the market is doing well, they will also do well. But please remember that when the market dips, T roll prices earn or revenues and earnings consequently will also dip. So that is something to keep in mind. But as you can see, it's all going in the right direction. It's going in line with the market. Let's look at the net income. And the net income is also growing at a nice pace albeit at a slower pace over the past 10 years at 5.83%, but still growing and that's something we like to see in terms of an investment. Now let's go and look at the earnings per share. So the earnings per share are growing at a nice 7.15% per year over the past 10 years. And as you can see again, they're growing just in line with the market and they're actually growing pretty strongly. But as we saw in 2022, so as you can see it was about half, so they had about 13.12%. Uh, in terms of their earnings per share in 2021 but then 2022 when the market dipped and it dipped a lot their earnings per share also dipped basically in half so that's something to keep in mind when i say that their earnings are volatile they are volatile but they do tend to trend in the upper direction over a long period of time now let's go and look at the strength of that balance sheet like we saw so they've they've never really had to take on a lot of debt they, they've been very, very disciplined in terms of their capital allocation strategy. So they generate large amounts of cash because their business is very scalable. They don't need the debt in order to operate as a uh, business. They, they just generate cash and then they divvy out that cash either in the form of dividends to investors or they buy back common stock or shares, thereby making you a larger equity holder in the T. Rowe Price company or they reinvest it back into their business and they also have to pay their employees and things like that. So again, it's a very scalable business, which is what I love to see. They just, you know, have cash. They don't need to take on debt. And this peach line here is, is those capital leases again, which I don't really consider debt. So they're, they're, they're swimming in cash. It's, it's great to see. And this is one of those companies that I love to have in my portfolio because they just keep generating a bunch of free cash flow for me and then they can pay out that free cash flow as dividends. Now speaking of, of dividends, let's go and look at their dividend history. So when we look at their 10 year dividend history or their 10 year dividend growth, they've been growing at a 12.37% per year over the past 10 years. So great, great dividend growth for me. So me as an investor, I've bought my T-Row shares, I've locked in my uh, what a 4.3% dividend yield. I believe I got it at around 4.5% dividend yield on cost. And now just naturally as they raise this dividend over time, I will have a higher yield on cost in my original investment. So as you can see, they've been growing this dividend uh, very well over time. Just the last dividend increase was just I think around 1%. And again, that is because of the results here in 2022 where their uh, assets under management fell because of the market performance uh, or what people called the bear market in 2022. So they were just a little bit more disciplined with their dividend increases. So again, when things are great, they will raise those dividends. And then when things are not, they will not raise them as much or barely anything, but it's still a dividend increase and, and I'm totally okay with it. Now these large green lines, this is what happens when they issue a special dividend. So they do issue special dividends sporadically. As you can see here, 2015, they had a special dividend. And then in 2021, they had a special dividend. So five, six years, they had a special dividend. And what happened was that if you look at their cash, you can see that they accumulated a decent amount of cash and they paid it out to shareholders. So as they accumulate this cash, they then issue special dividends and then they paid it out to shareholders because what happens in a company is, when you have too much free cash flow and you can't really invest it back to the company or there isn't really a opportunity that will provide a very high investment return on that cash to please your shareholders, you will issue a special dividend and then they will take that capital and then you can return it back to the shareholder. And I love to see that because that means that the company is thinking about me as a shareholder and paying me back uh, in terms of dividends. 
for my investment. So that is great to see. Now the shares outstanding, naturally we should think that these are going down over time. Yeah, again, they're not buying them back at a huge rate, about 1.38% per year over the past 10 years, but they have started buying them back over the past uh, eight or nine years. So they are slowly reducing their share count as we see. So that's great to see in a company that I'm invested in. Again, buying back these shares, canceling them and making me a larger shareholder uh, over time. So that was T. Rowe Price. Uh, that was T. Rowe Price in a snapshot. Now to conclude, uh, I hold T. Rowe Price in my dividend growth portfolio here on YouTube. I think it's a great holding. Do I think it's going to generate 16, 17, 18, 19% for me per year over the next 20 years? No, I don't think so. It's a very great company in terms of paying a dividend, very stable. I believe I can project its future cash flow as well. In my, and so basically, in, in my opinion, is very predictable other than the performance of the market. So that right there is the volatility. So if you're investing into Euro price, you need to understand that your investments or your uh, investment in T-Roll price will be volatile based on the market. So when times are good, the earnings of T-Roll price will hopefully be very great as well. When times are bad, and probably the t earnings of T-Roll price will also not be that great. But if you are comfortable with that risk, I think it's a great company. It's a dividend aristocrat. It's been raising its dividend for more than 25 plus years. It's been paying that out. They've been in business for like we saw 85 or 86 years. They have a great history of managing uh, clients' monies. They they manage, or clients' funds, sorry. They manage institutional funds. They manage private client funds. And they have a steady, a steady flow. So one of the other risks with T. Rowe Price is that as people move towards more passive investing or ETFs or index funds, they could lose business. But as long as they continue to innovate and offer those products to their clients, so they offer ETFs like we saw with their actively managed approach, they're still going to be doing very well. So there's still that large, large percentage of the market in which institutional funds, for instance, they go to these money managers or these fund managers and they want them to manage their funds for them as opposed to investing passively so their business it's not in my opinion going away anytime soon maybe in 20 30 years they might have some trouble but as long as they keep innovating and doing well in terms of performance then i think that they will still be around and a great dividend uh growth stock in my opinion as we saw so that was my video on T. Rowe Price and the company analysis. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give my video a like. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. I, I would really appreciate it. Again, I produce all this content for free. And my only goal here is to help other investors on their investing journey. So without without uh, any other <laughs> further ado, uh, thank you for listening to my video on T. Rowe Price. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Please note, I am not a financial advisor by any means. This content is merely for your entertainment and edu educational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence when investing as I am not liable for any investing losses or investing risks or decisions that you make. Thank you again for listening and have a great day.